Let's talk about the One Piece iceberg. No, not the character. The iceberg that contains the greatest mysteries and theories in One Piece. I've already seen a lot of videos breaking down icebergs for different topics, but as far as I know, there is none about One Piece. In case you don't know, the iceberg video format is a system of levels starting with popular and mainstream theories and mysteries of a certain topic, the tip of the iceberg that everyone knows, and then moving deeper towards the wildest and darkest theories the internet has to offer. Starting with tier number one, Crocodile was born a woman. Rising above the surface of the waters, we have a couple of tier one theories that you've probably heard about before. Like the theory that Crocodile was assigned female at birth. Now, Sir Crocodile, the first Chichibukai that Luffy ever took down, remains to this day one of the fandom's favorite villains in the entire manga. His cunning plans, awesome sand powers, and an unforgettable laugh make him stand high above more dangerous foes, even if he was defeated by a pre-time skip Luffy. But the leader of Baroque Works, Mr. Zero if you will, has a secret even more secret than his own identity. Moreover, the knowledge of the secret is known to one Emporio Ivankov, the ruler of the Kamabaka Queendom. And just what secret would the holder of the hormone fruit be privy to? Well, that Crocodile was born biologically female and then, thanks to Ivankov's powers, physically transitioned to become male. In other words, Crocodile is a trans man. After all, Oda's drawing of a young crocodile is quite gender ambiguous. Admirals versus Monster Trio The Marines have three very strong military forces. The Straw Hats have three very strong pirates. They will fight, or so the story went before Akainu earned a promotion and Aokiji went off to hang with Blackbeard. However, that's not going to stop fans from speculating who the final matchups will be when it comes time for the Straw Hats to take on the strongest marine powers. Luffy has it out for Akainu, obviously. Sanji's kicks will have to stack up against Kizaru's lightspeed kicks. Zoro and Fujitora both have swords, a match made in heaven, and what about Green Bull? Well, we just learned that Aramaki is a highly prejudiced individual and we happen to have the powerful fishman slash civil rights advocate Jinbei on the crew as well. It's really not much of a monster trio anymore anyways, but we're looking forward to the Admirals versus Monster Quartet, I guess. One Piece was the friends we made along the way. What is the One Piece? Well, the greatest fear among the fans is that the answer is... Nothing. There is no treasure, no world-shaking revelation. Like the old saying goes, life is a journey, not a destination. Finding the One Piece was never about material gain. That's why all of the treasure seekers who only sought riches were doomed to fail, but the adventurous Luffy and his crew who only wanted freedom will be the ones to attain it. The quote-unquote real treasure was the adventures they had and all the friends they made along the way. Now that I think about it, the treasure being nothing actually fits really well thematically. But thankfully, Oda-sensei has actually gone on record saying that the One Piece is a physical, tangible treasure. So thank godness the cop-out ending has been avoided and we're getting something cool and shiny in a few years' time. Dragon's Windlogia Fruit Now, normal absentee fathers go out to buy milk. Real absentee fathers go out to wage war against an oppressive government, though. When Luffy finally met his absentee father in Loketown, he was accompanied by a powerful gale that enabled the Straw Hats' escape from Captain Smoker. Now this very convenient storm, tinged green for some reason in the anime, seemed almost supernaturally fortunate. Well, so our best guess is really that while the winds were supernatural, they weren't supernaturally lucky, if you get what I'm saying. They were just supernatural in the sense that they were the result of dragon's devil fruit power, which is likely a wind or storm fruit. After all, this revolutionary who wants to overturn the status quo could be said to bring the winds of change, and we all do know that Oda's up for some good wordplay after all here and there, so very possible. Zoro is from Wano. Now this popular theory is pretty much confirmed. Zoro was from an island named after the Shimotsuke clan. He definitely has some lineage here, but what we would still love some answers on is who exactly he's descended from. He looks exactly like the former daimyo of the Shimotsuke, Ushimaru. However, Oda has gone out of his way in an SBS to deny that Zoro is Ushimaru's son, despite very directly and obviously hinting at it in the manga. So. Is he a nephew, grandson? Just tell us who he is, Oda. We're begging you, literally. Carrot for Nakama. 
Now, people seem to think that the hope for this rabbit mink joining the crew is dead in the water. She didn't stow away when the crew left Wano, shirking her responsibility as the new ruler of Zo. Instead, Karibu was in the barrel. Oda even played with our hearts and mocked us by having the Sunny use a special new technique. The rabbit screw in which the ship is propelled by a barrel house propeller that does look like a rabbit. But did you even consider this? Yeah, sure, Karibu is in the barrel, but you know what? Karibu can also fit a lot of barrels inside him. And what's in those barrels? Carrots, probably. I will not give up hope that Carrot is still stowed away inside of Karibu Swamp until we get a direct refutation of this theory. You know, never give up on Carrot because she'll never give up on you. Sanji is a prince. All right, give yourself a round of applause, One Piece fans. You got this one correct. Before the Whole Cake Island arc, tons of fans predicted that Sanji would turn out to be a prince. All the way back in the Baroque Work saga, he assumed the secret identity of Mr. Prince. And so the theory went that this was more than just a nickname, this secret identity held a big secret after all. In actuality, Sanji was going to be a prince. And then quite a bit later, we received news that Sanji was actually from the North Blue and had somehow ended up in the East Blue together with Zeph. During the confrontation with Kuma, Sanji revealed that he'd be the one to cause the Straw Hats the most trouble down the line. There was also the running gag that every single one of Sanji's wanted posters didn't actually show his face for one reason or another. However, Andres Rosa, as soon as Sanji's face was shown, his bounty condition was changed to only alive, pretty much proving that he was connected to someone with a lot of power in the One Piece world. And so finally, we learned that Sanji was in fact a prince of the German kingdom, proving many eagle-eyed fans 100% correct. Garb is the leader of SWORD. So in case you don't know, SWORD is this secret organization within the Marines with the aim of making the Marines a force for good in the world, instead of a force for propping up the Celestial Dragons. Since two of the most prominently known members of SWORD are Kobe and Helmeppo, who notably trained directly under Monkey D. Garb, well, logic would follow that Garb himself is the secret leader of this organization. Seven Moons We know that Minx turns Sulong under the full moon and that NL is chilling out on a moon, but a much more important question is, which moon? Now, in the library of Ohara, we can see a model of the One Piece planet and its orbiting satellites that clearly show seven moons. Now, if this is the case, does the world still have all of these moons or were some of them destroyed somehow? Or do we just conveniently never see more than one in the sky at once? Hopefully, the scientific mastermind Vegapine drops some more moon knowledge on us very soon. NL's return. And speaking of moons, Enel is up to something on that moon. In his cover story, he reached a fairy worth and found the ruins of an ancient civilization that seemed to hold illustrations of the ancient weapons. He also used his devil fruit to power up a bunch of long dormant automatons. All this and on top, he even met actual space pirates. So clearly, Enel is going to play into the story again somehow as so, so many cover story characters actually do. So. How exactly are the Straw Hats going to encounter this god of all gods once again? Is he going to strike back down to Earth with a robot army, or are the Straw Hats, much like the game stock stock did, going to the moon? 10th Titanic Captain Aokiji the Blackbeard Pirates have 10 Titanic captains, but we have yet to find out who number 10 is. So far, we only know of 9 Blackbeard crew members, plus Blackbeard himself, but since Burgess is the first captain, Teach doesn't factor into this count. He's the Admiral. Now, there have been a lot of wild guesses for who this final Blackbeard crew member could possibly be, but the prevailing theory is the former Marine Admiral Aokiji. Seeing Kuzan go fully onto the Blackbeard crew and abandon his sense of justice is a wild idea, but we do know that Aokiji is currently allied with them in some capacity. The fact that we now know for sure that he's actually part of Blackbeard's crew hugely increased the stakes when it's finally time for the Straw Hats to actually fight Blackbeard and co. Monster Points Awakened Zone now, it's heavily implied that the Impel Down Jailers are Awakened Zone Fruit users. If that's so, they'd be the first Awakened Devil Fruit users that we ever see in the entire series, unless there's actually one we saw first, and wouldn't you know it, they were actually a member of the Straw Hat crew. Chopper ingesting three Rumble Balls might have triggered a Forced Zone Awakening. 
And so Monster Point may in fact have been the very first Devil Fruit Awakening that we ever saw in the series. All of this and we haven't even scratched the surface. Now if you're an actual hardcore One Piece fan, you probably know all of these theories and easter eggs already, but now get ready to hold your breath because we're diving down to see what the One Piece iceberg holds in tier level 2. Shanks Davy Backfight Among One Piece's so-called fans, there are a lot of people, including me, who think that the Davy Backfight and the Long Ring Long Long Island arc are boring and unimportant. Real fans, of course, believe in foxy supremacy. We also know that Oda Sensei doesn't have any unimportant arcs in the story, just look at all of the Skypiea deniers right now. So how will the Davy backfight play into the story again? Well, when it comes time for Shanks and Luffy to finally meet again, this theory has it that the two crews will engage in a friendly Davy backfight to celebrate their reunion. Roger's Gomu Gomu Fruits. Oh yeah. Over the course of the series, we've learned of a startling number of similarities between Roger and Luffy, the former and future Pirate King. The Straw Hat belonged to Roger. They shared the same secret dream, so why not the same devil fruit? Now this long-held theory believed that the former owner of the Gomu Gomu no Mi was none other than Goldie Roger. However, Kaido's recent statement that Roger didn't have any devil fruit powers seems to pretty much disprove this theory. So we can pretty much say goodbye to our hopes for a stretchy Roger. All of Usopp's lies come true. The pirates attacking Serap Village, the giant goldfish, a huge mole, a beautiful swordsman with meat. Usopp has told many, many lies throughout the series, and one theory holds that by the end of the story, all of these lies will have come true. Now, if that's the case, are they really lies? One major lie that we still need to see come true is Usopp leading an army 8,000 men strong. We get close to it in Dressrosa, but we still need to pump up those numbers, so let's cross our fingers for the giants of Elbaf. Kuina is Tashigi. Zoro's childhood friend Kuina was the catalyst for his dream. Every day that he strives to accomplish his dream of becoming the world's greatest swordsman, he does it partly because of his promise made to Kuina. However, what if she wasn't dead at all? What if after losing her memories, she actually grew up to become the marine rival Tashigi, the second hand to Smoker? Now, it wouldn't be Oda's first time using amnesia as a plot point, looking at you, Big Mom and Sabo. After all, Tashigi looks just like Huina and has a similar love of swords. Is this more of an easter eggy coincidence or is there more to this entire story here? Luffy will get Roger's disease. Now before Roger's execution, he was diagnosed with an incurable disease. So in the ongoing list of things that Luffy has inherited from Roger, will he too contract Pirate king Anitis? Will the story end just like it began with the death of a pirate king? After all, we've gotten lots and lots of hints throughout the story about Luffy's short shortening his lifespan. Gear second shortens his lifespan, his adrenaline treatments from Ivankov shortened his lifespan, a side effect of Gear 5 appeared to be temporarily transforming into an old man, so will this spell the end for Luffy? Is this exertion related to his incurable disease the same one that Roger had? Could think that the Thousand Sunnies Doctor has a goal being able to cure every disease in the world, cause Luffy might need it. The Egg on Roger's Ship In many flashbacks, we can see a massive egg incubating on the back of Roger's ship, the Oro Jackson. Now, what could have hatched from a huge egg like this? Was it Marco, a dragon? Was it related to the ancient weapon Uranus? Could the One Piece be the world's largest omelette? Many theories have hatched from this giant egg. <laughs> oh my god, this one. The most likely theory? Well, maybe it was just Tamago taking a nap. Luffy's bounty is 5.6 billion berries. In Japanese, gomu means rubber or gum, as in the gomu gomu no mi. However, the words gomu can also be read as the number 56. 5, 6. Therefore, Oda has long associated the number 56 with Luffy. As a child, he's seen wearing a shirt with the number 56 on it. Lucy's Colosseum number was 0556. There are 56 members of the Bartow fan club and the Grand Fleet numbers over 5,600. Since Roger's final bounty was revealed to be a little bit over 5.5 billion berries, this theory predicts that Luffy's final bounty will barely surpass Roger's and also keep with the theme of Luffy being associated with the number 56. And so his final bounty will most likely be 5.6 billion berries. The Immortality Surgery 
On Dressrosa, we learned that Laws Ope Ope no Mi has a special ability. In exchange for the user's life, they can perform the so-called immortality surgery, making their targets immortal. Now, we don't have much additional information about the exact mechanics of this insane ability, but it doesn't seem like the thing that Oda, king of foreshadowing, would casually drop and then never bring up again. Forget about Chekhov's gun, this is Chekhov's nuke. As for who Law may end up sacrificing his life for, it's a bit of a mystery. Doflamingo, of course, wanted Law to use it on him, but with the former Shichibukai now locked up, it's a good bet it'll be someone else. Though, we don't think Doflamingo will be an Impel Down forever. So the real question is, did a past user of this fruit use this surgery on an seemingly ancient immortal character like Imu or the Gorosei? Will Law use it on Luffy to circumvent all the side effects of the aforementioned pirate? Kingitis. Or will someone more nefarious use it? I mean, Blackbeard's confrontation with Law has us a little bit worried right now. Usopp's Conqueror's Hockey. Usopp is the ultimate underdog in One Piece. In a world of super-powered beings, he's someone that us normal weakling humans can really relate to. However, in addition to his insane stamina and pain tolerance, he's also been shown to have some incredible feats. Most notably, he unlocked Observation Hockey when he stopped Sugar from transforming Law and Luffy into toys on Dressrosa. Now, Usopp's ultimate goal is to become a brave warrior of the sea, and he's teased leading armies 8,000 soldiers strong. While he does seem to be a fearful coward, he's courageous in that he always overcomes this fear to take on opponents many times stronger than himself. Now, this really sounds like a conqueror to me, so maybe Usopp will join Luffy and Zoro as a member of the Straw Hats that can actually use the rarest form of hockey. The Straw Hat is the One Piece. And we're back to the question, what is the One Piece? It's not the friends we made along the way. That would just be silly and we already talked about that. Now, obviously it's the great treasure that Luffy has had all along. As far back as Orange Town, after Buggy stepped through the Straw Hat, we learned that it was Luffy's most prized possession, his treasure. How then could even finding Roger's treasure, the One Piece, surpass the treasure Luffy's already always had? But this theory works more than just on a metaphorical level. What if the straw hat is genuinely important? We know that the hat passed from Roger to Shanks to Luffy. We also know that Im Sama has a massive giant straw hat in a cold storage on Marijua. Somehow, a straw hat is obviously connected to the ancient history and the void century. So, is it going too far to think that the hat is the One Piece itself? Scopper Gaban visits Crocus. Once upon a time, in a fateful cover story that would spawn theory after theory, we were treated to everyone's favorite whale doctor, Crocus, chatting it up with a mysterious figure. That figure was dressed in an Amigasa straw hat and Wano-style robes, giving the impression that this character would be connected to Wano. However, the Wano arc came and went with no reveal like it to speak of. Now, since Crocus was the doctor for the Roger Pirates, one leading idea for the identity of his character is none other than Scopa Gaban. After other former Roger Pirates like Rayleigh have become more and more important players in the story, it seems like it would only make sense to introduce Scopper Gaban into the story as well. As Roger's number three, he's been featured prominently in many of Roger's flashbacks, but we still haven't met him in the current timeline. And really, at this rate, will we ever meet Roger's third in command? Admiral Kobe. Now, it's unlikely that Akainu will promote Kobe to become one of the highest military powers. And besides, Pink isn't on the color wheel, so how would Kobe possibly fit in with the current naming conventions of the Admirals? He doesn't even have an uber-powerful Logia Devil Fruit either. However, Kobe's dream is to become a Marine Admiral, so by the end of the series, he will. One Piece is a series where characters we love achieve their dreams. And so if the end of the series sees a reformation of the Marines to become a true force for justice in the world, Sword will most likely lead that transformation, and with them, Kobe may become one of the leaders of the Marines. Zunisha is Pluton. On Fishman Island, we learned that the ancient weapon Poseidon was not a physical object, but a living person. 
Unlike Pluton, which we'd heard was a warship, Poseidon was actually the mermaid princess Shirahoshi and her power to control the Sea Kings. Now in Wano, we learned that Pluton is actually housed beneath Wano. However, we haven't quite laid our eyes on it yet, so perhaps the real story is more complicated and Momonosuke's ability to communicate with and command the giant elephant Zunisha is somehow connected with the ancient weapon Pluton. The devil fruits are man-made technology. Dr. Vegapunk and Caesar Clown's smile technology has allowed the criminal underworld to produce artificial devil fruits. Now most of them are really pale reflection of real devil fruit capabilities and many of them are out right defective. However, what if all devil fruits are actually artificial? What if these seemingly magic fruits are actually technological creations of the ancient kingdom? Could it be that devil fruits didn't just occur as a byproduct of nature, but were specifically cultivated and created to imbue great powers upon those who eat those fruits? When Vegapunk cracked the code to recreating Kaido's fruit, he wasn't imitating nature, but recreated an ancient technology pretty much confirmed at this point. Weevil is Whitebeard's real son. When we first were introduced to Edward Weevil, the only Shichibukai who didn't get to accomplish a single thing in the entire story before the Warlord system was disbanded, we had a lot of thoughts. Thoughts such as, what's this guy's deal? And there's no way that this clown is Whitebeard's son. Oda, however, likes to write his story in a way that keeps us constantly surprised. And what would be the most surprising reveal in relation to Weevil? Well, that this wasn't a lie after all. Mr. Newgate, you are the father. Oh, are these theories not enough for you? Well, we're only just getting started, really. We've stuck our heads slightly under the water surface, and now it's time to start swimming, because we've arrived at tier number three. The raid will end in failure. <laughs> Well, this is a nice one. Viewers of a certain YouTuber, Mr. Morge, will be very familiar with this theory. Once upon a time, fans hoped for a five-act structure to the Wano arc. However, as Act 3 stretched longer and longer and longer, it became evident that this would be the climax of the arc. Now, this theory went based on the five-act structure of many Kabuki plays, which says that at the end of the third act, there is a great tragedy, followed by a final battle in Act 4 and a resolution in Act 5. And so so we kept waiting for our great tragedy. We thought perhaps the Scabbard's defeat by Kaido would be the tragedy. We thought that maybe Luffy being thrown into the sea was the tragedy. We thought that Luffy's literal death was the tragedy. And so the idea, popularized and then memefied by Mr. Morge's channel and his audience, was that after a loss during the raid, the allies would have to recoup their losses and then train to fight another day before ultimately beating Kaido. However, in the end, Oda once again did defy our expectations here. The mythical Cerberus Zone Fruits. Blackbeard always works in threes. He has three skulls on his flag, he has three pistols, he left three scars on Shanks' face. Now this popular theory says that in addition to his Darkness Logia and Earthquake Paramecia fruit, Blackbeard has a third fruit, one that allows him to have three different devil fruits in the first place. He is a mythical dog zone model Cerberus. This three-headed dog of legend just works too well for the three motive that Blackbeard has going for him and would make him a really good boy. Law is part of sword. Now this is another theory that's part of a specific YouTuber's agenda. This idea was popularized by Randy Troy. According to him, Law may be playing a long game, being a secret marine agent all along. It would mean that he takes after his mentor Rosinante, like so many other One Piece characters who also take after their mentors. This secret identity would also make sense given the interactions between X-Drake, another sword member, and Law on Wano. Their cryptic conversations seem to reveal a sort of connection between the two. Another piece of evidence for the theory deals with the mysterious Rocky Port incidents which gave Law the reputation to become a Shichibukai, and in which Kobe, another sword member, played the hero role. The Straw Hat Devil Fruit. For those of you who were not weekly readers or watchers during Dressrosa, this may surprise you, but when the Mera Mera no Mi was up for grabs, there was no shortage of theories for who would finally eat that fruit. 
Some theories were Sanji, who had already been seen using flames, or even Frankie for some reason. Sabo hadn't yet re-entered the story and there was no telling when or if this other brother would ever return. There were even many theories that an antagonist would eat the fruit, leading to Luffy having to fight against his brother's devil fruit. However, one of the wildest speculations to come out of this time was that Luffy's straw hat would get a devil fruit. Luffy himself, of course, couldn't eat the fruit since he'd already eaten the Gomu Gomu no Mi. However, ever since Alabasta, we've known that inanimate objects were able to consume devil fruits as well. And so this actually led to a ton of people believing that the Straw Hat would gain the power to become fire, allowing Luffy and Ace to continue fighting alongside each other in a way. But hey, who knows, maybe it's not too late for the Straw Hat to get another fruit. Vegapunk the Revolutionary Why would Bartholomew Kuma, a revolutionary, willingly let Vegapunk turn him into a mindless machine that does the bidding of the world governments? Well, according to this theory, it's because Vegapunk has always been playing both sides of the conflicts. While Vegapunk's happy to accept the government's research and develop funding, they may not agree politically with the government's goals. They might, in fact, want to use their technology to make the world a better place and only make weapons in a trade-off that allows them to fund the research that he really wants to do. So it's possible that Kuma still retains some of his old will. And this has just been sort of kind of confirmed as we know. It's possible that Kuma still retains some of his old will as well. After all, before going full pacifista, he was able able to send the Straw Hats to their time skip destination, as well as guarding the Thousand Sunny. So yeah, this current arc right now on Egghead Island will reveal a lot more about this. The D is for the Dawn. Monkey D. Luffy, Portugas D. Ace, Jaguar D. Sol, those with the D initials are the natural enemy of the gods. The Celestial Dragons fear these members of the D clan, but what exactly does the D stand for? Destiny? Destruction? Death? Despair? Delirium? Desire? Dream? Oh no, it's probably not one of the seven endless. It's the wrong series for that. Instead, we should look to the original One Piece one-shot and the title of the first chapter of the series. Roman's Dawn. Luffy, the new Joy Boy, is foretold to bring a new dawn of the world. So, what likelier candidate than this for Luffy's real middle name? Con D. Oriano. A lesser known member of the D Clan and one of the strongest in the universe is, of course, Condoriano. Much like how Trafalgar D. Water Law hit his true name under the disguise of Trafalgar Law, Con D. Oriano hit his D initial by going by the name Condoriano. For those of you unaware, Condi Oriano is a member of the Straw Hat crew that made his first appearance in the G8 arc, the only anime filler arc that might as well be canon according to the fandom. This truly mighty member of the D-Clan single-handedly saved the Straw Hats and enabled them to escape the G8 base by bravely allowing himself to be imprisoned while Robin went on an espionage mission. Will Oda ever make Condi Oriano manga canon? Well, we can only hope so. Shanks is a celestial dragon. This red-haired Yonko is hiding something big. What kind of pirate is allowed to just waltz into the Gorosei's chambers to hold a private meeting? Well, the kind that is secretly a celestial dragon. This really long-term theory stated that Shanks is more than just a friendly, party-loving mentor to Luffy. Instead, he has a more mysterious and sinister past as a member of the Tendiubito. That's pretty much confirmed that Shanks was still an infant when Roger took him onto his ship and found him, uh, probably sometime around the God Valley incident. So it's very likely that he was adopted by Roger and was a survivor of that island's disappearance. And since God Valley was the island of the celestial dragons? There you got it. Big Mom and the Beast Pirates in the Grand Fleet. The Grand Fleet isn't over yet. Having the members of Olumbus's crew and the Tontada is one thing, but to finally and really take on the world government, the Straw Hats might need some truly heavier hitters. Enter the crews of the former Yonko, Big Mom, and Kaido. On Hulk Kick Island, Luffy made an ally through the hard-fought battle he did with Katakuri. The two, despite being on opposite sides, came to recognize and respect each other deeply as individuals. In addition to Big Mom's son becoming an ally, Kaido's son too befriended Luffy. Yamato wanted to sail away with the crew but remained to act as Wano's protector from outside forces. And so with these two Yonko children as allies, it's likely that with Big Mom and Kaido out of the picture, the remnants of these two crews could 
could end up fighting on the Straw Hat side for the final war. The second time skip. Especially before the revelation that was Gear 5, it was a mystery how the Straw Hats could ever contend with the seemingly invincible Yonko. Oh, how did they deal with insurmountable foes the last time? Through a time skip, of course. So why not Shippuden the Straw Hats? a second time. But the real reason why this didn't happen? Well, I think that Oda just couldn't figure out how to make Frankie's shoulders any bigger, honestly. The immortal Gorosei. A lot of characters in One Piece have flashbacks where we can see depictions of their younger selves. We're treated to younger in their prime versions of old characters like Garp, Sengoku, or Whitebeard. And when appropriate, we see those characters de-age to children. We've seen Buggy and Shanks as kids, among many others. However, during Robin's flashback, we got to see the Gorosei of approximately 20 years ago, and they look exactly the same. With Oda paying such good attention to the timeline and drawing the details of characters aging so, so well, this seems too big to be just an oversight. The designs of the five Elder Stars were already old, but they have not changed even a tiny bit over this entire time span. Which raises the question, do they age at all? Or are the Gorosei immortal and unaging? Perhaps they're the same rulers of the world government that were already around during the Void century. Brook is Kuzan's grandfather. They both have afros, they both have ice powers. Need we say more? Now, as we sink deeper and deeper, the iceberg only grows in size. Who could have predicted that what already seemed so massive above the surface would contain such unseen multitudes? Do the depth of this fandom really ever end? Well, our craft has now reached tier level 4. Crocomom. After Anna's lobby, Luffy learned that he had a dad. This dad was none other than Monkey D. Dragon, the most wanted man in the world, another thorn in the government side, like father, like son. However, according to popular scientific sources, in order to be born, a shonen protagonist also needs a mother on top of a father. However, we have no clue whose Luffy mom is. Or do we? Now, Oda has gone on record saying that he has drawn Luffy's mom in the series more than one time, so who could it be? Is it a background revolutionary still hanging out with Dragon, or is it someone we know much better? A certain Sir Crocodile. Now, as we've learned at the top of this iceberg quite a while ago, Crocodile might very well have been female at births before crossing paths with Ivankov, a revolutionary who would have been in proximity to Dragon. So, before his transition, could he have had a child with Dragon? A certain Luffy, perhaps? Usopp is the narrator. The narrator of One Piece is a very curious figure, and our greatest literary scholars have tried to figure out the exact identity of said narrator. At times, this person speaks of future events as if they're recalling the story from a later date and thus can foreshadow what's yet to come. A prime example of this is during the formation of the Straw Hat Grand Fleet, when the narrator speaks of a cataclysmic event that they'll one day participate in. So is this narrator just a disembodied, omniscient, and omnipresent voice, or is it an actual actual character in the story. Now, this theory goes that the story of One Piece is actually being told retroactively by Usopp. Hopefully this story is just a little bit more truthful than the ones that he usually tells. Charlotte Bonnie. Bonnie is Kuma's daughter. She is a princess of the Sorbet Kingdom. We do know this now, but we didn't always. But what we did know is that Bonnie has pink hair. And who else has pink hair? Charlotte Linlin, Big Mom herself. After all, Lola has pink hair and ended up being Big Mom's daughter. Come to think of it, we don't know who Bonnie's mother is. Has Kuma been one of Big Mom's many ex-husbands all along? The Thousand Sunny is Pluton. Now, I know I said at the beginning of this video that we weren't talking about that iceberg, but for this one, we're gonna talk about this iceberg. During Water 7, CP9 was searching for the blueprints to the ancient weapon Pluton, a powerful warship capable of mass destruction. Now, they thought that Iceberg had those plans, but in actuality, it was his adopted brother Frankie who had them in the first place, and in order to protect them from falling into the wrong hands, 
Frankie burnt the blueprints so that the government couldn't obtain them later on. And then, Frankie constructed the Straw Hat's new ship, the Thousand Sunny. And given Frankie's intellect and his immense cyborg inventor brain, it's not really that far-fetched to think that he could have memorized all of Pluton's blueprints. So could some of Pluton's super powerful features have actually made it into the design of his dream ship, the Thousand Sunny? Dragon is not Garb's son. Both of these One Piece powerhouses hold the Monkey family name, but one theory states that they're not actually blood-related. While Garp is Luffy's grandpa and Dragon is Luffy's father, it's not as clear-cut out that Dragon is actually Garp's son. Instead, Dragon could have married into the Monkey family and much in the way that Ace took his mother's last name, Dragon could have taken his wife's last name to hide some part of his heritage. After all, doesn't Dragon's silhouette look suspiciously like that of Rock Stizebeck, Pirate King Buggy. Buggy D. Clown has been failing his way upwards throughout the entire series. He started as a lowly pirate in the East Blue, but after his arrest, Luffy's prison break enabled him to become one of the first pirates to escape from Impel Down. Thanks to taking the credit for the mass escape, as well as his status as a former Roger crew member, well, he was able to elevate himself to the lofty position of Shichibukai. And then things took a turn for the worse for Buggy when his giant crew members left to join the Straw Hat Grand Fleet, and then the Shichibukai system was outright dissolved. However, thanks to the Cross Guild, he has now cemented his status as one of the four Emperors of the Sea. If the trend continues, we could see Buggy become a bona fide king of the the pirates, at least temporarily. After all, doesn't it just feel right for this character to be present at Laugh Tale? He's been going in the direction alongside Luffy and has such a history with Shanks that him being with us at the end just seems to make sense. Provided that he doesn't get an inconveniently typed illness again, of course. Marco will become an egg. Marco the Phoenix can turn into a a phoenix. Wow, his epithet is really on the nose. <laughs> Anyways, despite his cool healing powers and powers to fight, well, we still haven't really seen this pineapple activate the most famous of all phoenix powers. He still hasn't died and been reborn. So in the final war, will Marco be tragically killed only to avoid death and resurrect himself in the form of a brand new, far younger Marco? I'm really not that satisfied with Baron Tamago being the only character with an egg-based transformation, and we will not be satisfied until Marco too dies and becomes an egg and subsequently a tiny Marco baby. The Will of P. Listen, I, I don't make the rules here. If you're a One Piece character and your name starts with the letter P, you don't get to die. Sorry. Now, granted, most One Piece characters don't get to die unless they're in a flashback, but this one goes double for our P-named characters. Pell sacrificing himself to save Alabasta from a massive bomb? No problem. Pell eats bomb for breakfast. Old Man Pagaya. Connie's dad taking the full brunt of Enel's lightning powers. Well, maybe Luffy is not the only rubber man after all. Peckums was riddled with bullet holes and dropped into shark infested waters. Now, don't worry, he's alright after all. And the newest member of this club, Pound, he inexplicably survived the attacks of all the Big Mom pirates. The Will of P is really the only force in One Piece that can rival the might of the Will of D, and this is why we'll likely also get to see our good friend Pedro once again in the near future. Blackbeard will kill Shanks. Now we all know that Oda loves to make us cry. Oda also loves giving Luffy one billion reasons to punch Blackbeard. Blackbeard was largely responsible for Ace's death. He's the main rival for Luffy's ultimate goal, the One Piece. Blackbeard has captured Luffy's good friend Kobe and may do the same for his chief ally Law. And moreover, they have different tastes in pies, a conflict that cannot be overcome by any other means than violence. Now, we also know that Shanks and Blackbeard have a history as well. They met each other all the way back during childhood. Blackbeard even gave Shanks his signature scars at some point. It was ages and ages ago when we saw the series' first meeting between Yonko, when Shanks went to Whitebeard to warn him about Teach's machinations. Now, I'm scared to even speak the word, so let's knock on wood as we say, 
Blackbeard might kill Shanks. He could even do so before Luffy is able to reunite with his mentor and return the Straw Hats. It would likely be the most emotional moment in the entire series up to date, but it would definitely make for the most satisfying smackdown in manga history once Luffy got his revenge. Luffy's Execution now, a lot of classic tales are circular. They do end where they began, and the story can have a beautiful poetry to it when the author uses this type of writing style. One Piece opens up with the execution of the Pirate King Goldie Roger. It could very well end with the execution of the next Pirate King, Monkey D. Luffy. If Roger's death urged a new generation of pirates to set out to sea, Luffy's could too. Luffy is the type of person who wants to see everyone in the world taste the freedom and adventure of a life at sea. And as bittersweet as Luffy's death would obviously be, it could also make for a beautiful ending to the series. Kadibu Baroque Works This is another theory by the YouTuber Randy Troy. Kadibu, the swampiest character in One Piece, has stumbled face first into some huge information about the ancient weapons. Information that he's hinted he wants to bring to a certain someone. Now, prior to the Wano arc, it was thought that he'd trade his information to either Big Mom or Kaido, but with both of them out of the picture, we're really running out of options here. Teach is a prime candidate, but this theory posts another major player in the new world. So Crocodile of the Cross Guild. Now this theory is based on the fact that Karibu doesn't look too far off from the concept arc of a certain Mr. Ten. Mr. Ten was a Baroque Works member that was mentioned by Vivi, but who we never actually met in the series. However, in Oda's early sketches for the character, there are some similarities to Karibu. The face shape and generally wild hair are pretty true to Karibu's character design right now. So is it possible that Karibu has been a former underling of Crocodile all along? After all, Crocodile's initial goal in Alabasta was to obtain the ancient weapon Pluton, and now Karibu could help him finally succeed in his grand mission. The Emerald City When Straw Hats first encountered Bellamy on Jaya, he laughed at them for believing into myths such as the City of Gold and the One Piece. Now, in this list of ludicrous dreams though, he also mentioned the mysterious Emerald City. Soon after this, the Straw Hats would encounter the City of Gold and Skypea, and Whitebeard has taught us that the One Piece is real. So, does Bellamy's third entry, the Emerald City, also exist? I mean, who's to say that Oda doesn't have time left in the final saga to shoehorn in a quick Wizard of Oz-inspired arc as well? The Lurking Legend Jin At Jump Festa 2018, Oda hinted that a lurking legend would appear in One Piece during the Wano arc. He also teased that this figure would be the Straw Hat's strongest opponent yet. Now, for years, fans have theorized on who this lurking legend could possibly be. But then again, Wano came and went, and we're still not 100% clear who the lurking legend was supposed to be. The most likely candidates are Im Sama or Roxy Zebek. However, the fan community has come up with some other truly wild guesses. Among these are Shiki, the Golden Lion, and other super powerful figures as well. The wildest guess, though, Jin the former crew member of Don Creek who the Straw Hats encountered during the Baratier arc. After all, Jin promised to meet our crew again one day in the New World, and we've been waiting ever since. Oh, look at that. We're halfway there. Well, at this point, we really dare not leave our craft. At least not if we don't want to get the bends. At this depth of fandom, the pressure of the depths really could crush us, just as the depths of the One Piece lore crushed the minds of casual fans. So onwards to tier number five. Koshiro is Denjiro. Before we learned that Koshiro was actually Denjiro after going through grudge-induced plastic surgery, many fans noticed that the Denjiro in Odin's flashbacks looked a whole lot like Koshiro. Hold on, let's flip back 1000 chapters and remind ourselves who Koshiro is, especially since that name is awfully similar to Kyoshiro in the first place. Now, Koshiro is this guy. Zoro's swordsmanship teacher and Kuina's father back from Shimotsuke village in the East Blue. And I can kind of understand why people would have thought that this was a candidate for Denjiro's identity. I mean, just look at him, he clearly just looks like an older Denjiro. And we know based on the Shimotsuke name that Koshiro probably has some connection to Wano. But leave it to Oda to surprise us with a man so angry, his face changed forever. Zoro's Sharingan. Oh yeah, Zoro's eye has been closed ever since the time skip. 
For some reason, he hasn't been allowed to wear a classic pirate eye patch because Oda's saving that eye patch for a very special character at some point. Now, a lot of the fanbase, though, presumably people who have watched a lot of Naruto, think that this eye can't just be injured. No, no, no. Zoro's closed eye must be hiding an amazing power up. Maybe he has a weird ringed eye like Mihawk now, or maybe Zoro just got so lost that he found himself in the wrong series and ended up with a Sharingan, or a Ringigan, or a Byakugan? Then Naruto has a lot of different kind of eyes now that I think about it. The One Piece is destroying the red line. Now, I don't know about you, but as a longtime member of the fan community, the legendary inherited will theory is the first mega theory that I really can remember reading. Many other supersized theories have come after, huge sprawling monoliths dedicated to uncovering the greatest mysteries of the series. What is the One Piece? What purpose do the ancient weapons serve? What is the will of D? So, so, so many theories with mountains of evidence have come and gone, but one of the first, possibly the first comprehensive and believable theory was the inherited will theory posted on the Arlon Park forums. In case you're unfamiliar with this, you should really read that theory in depth or watch one of the many YouTube videos covering it. But here's a quick version. The One Piece is destroying the red line, literally combining the seas of the world into One Piece. It would likely take the power of the ancient weapons to destroy the structure, it would mean the end of Marijoa, and thus it would fulfill Madame Charlie's prediction of destroying Fishman Island below it as well. And it would allow for many of the Straw Hats' dream to come true all at once. Nami would be free to sail all around the world and map it. Combining the seas would also create the all blue for Sanji. Brooke would be reunited with Laboon. The list goes on and on and on. Really, having this theory covered in brief here does it a bit of a disservice. So if you'd like to see it in a more comprehensive manner, kind of like going through all the evidence that people have accumulated, why not subscribe and let me know you want to see that. People in snowy countries don't sleep. Back on Drum Island, when Luffy is taking a sick Nami to Dr. Kureha, he tells Sanji a rumor that he once heard. He asks Sanji if he knew that people in snowy countries don't sleep, stating that if they do, they'll die. Now, curiously enough, in a classic turn of Oda's god tier foreshadowing, Drum Island was the very first arc in which we heard of a certain Blackbeard. Yes, we first saw Marshall D. Teach on Jaya, but Dalton of the Drum Kingdom stated that their kingdom was attacked by the Blackbeard pirates, which is why Wapol flees with his Legion of Doctors in the first place. Now, Luffy probably heard this rumor of people in snowy countries from Shanks, who knew Blackbeard as a child. Very likely, the rumor isn't about people from Winter Islands, but about Blackbeard himself, who speculated to never sleep. A young Shanks and Buggy may have taken this, combined with the fact that Teach is from a Winter Island to concoct the rumor that Luffy would repeat on Drum Island, setting us up for an eventual payoff when it came to Blackbeard. The D is a half moon. All right, we already talked about this. What could the D stand for? Goldie, Roger, Monkey D, Luffy, all of these natural enemy of gods have an initial in common, but one theory suggests, what if this initial didn't stand for a name at all? Maybe it's not Dream or Devil or Dawn or anything, but it's a pictogram. Maybe that D is actually a half moon. Now we do know that moons are important to the series. Enel is chilling on one, the Celestial Dragons and Winged Races are probably from a moon, the moon causes the Minx to transform into the Sulong form, so it wouldn't be that crazy for the D clan to also have a connection to the ever important moons of One Piece. Perhaps it's so important to them that it's literally in their very name. Sanji is dead. Now, we're not just talking about his fashion sense after stepping through Vegapunk's style changer. Back during the Zoe arc, there was a ravenous, bloodthirsty part of the fanbase who really were convinced that Sanji was dead. Let's look at the facts. Nami and the rest of the crew didn't want to talk about what happened to Sanji, but he was clearly absent during the arc. Then we found out that Sanji was wanted by a Yonko, and this was the very first time that we come face to face with a Yonko. Big Mom, after all, in her first introduction, was shown to be a cannibal. Now this was still the early post time skip, and people saw signs of a darker and harsher series. From the brutality of Doflamingo to seemingly willingness of Oda to kill off characters, compared to pre time skip, as evidenced with villains like Virgo and Monet, 
things were just looking more violent. And so some fans took this to mean that maybe he turned the story upside down by having us lose a member of the crew. People also believe that his only alive wanted poster might have been a deceptive thing to do. So thankfully this theory was very wrong and our shitty cook is still kicking. The time travel training montage. Now this theory belongs to the Raid Will Fail family of theories. It's very odd how little we actually know about Toki. We do know she's from the Void Century and therefore is a wellspring of important knowledge and yet after her sacrifice in Odin's castle we never hear from her again. However, since she flung the retainers forwards in time, it seemed that perhaps she had jumped forward in time herself as well. I mean, when things were at their most bleak for the Alliance in the war against Kaido and Big Mom, this theory stated that Toki would appear again and would once again fling out fighters to buy them more time to prepare against the Yonko as second one. I mean, Luffy seemed out of his element, especially before he unlocked Advanced Conqueror's Hockey and Gear 5. So how would he possibly beat Kaido without more time to train and prepare? Well, by doing the same thing that Kinemon and the others did, by going forward in time some undisclosed amounts so that he could train further and fight Kaido another day. Vegapunk the Alien Dr. Vegapunk has created the wildest technological marvels of the One Piece world. He's created artificial devil fruits, weather control systems, the Pacifista, and much, much more. How could one scientific genius make so many amazing inventions? We already know that aliens in the form of space pirates and possibly the winged races do exist, so perhaps Vegapunk is a long lost member of an advanced interstellar civilization introducing his people's technologies to the Blue Sea. Sadly, this one has also been debunked at this point, but the explanations that we got were maybe even better than this. Two Piece. What comes after the One Piece? The Two Piece, of course. Now, this in joke in the fandom states that after the final chapter closes on One Piece, Two Piece will begin serialization. After all, why would Shonen Jump let their biggest property rest when they could keep making those sweet stacks of pirate cash? And so, just how Naruto was followed by Boruto, following Naruto's son, one piece could be followed by two piece, then three piece, and so on and so on, until the inevitable heat death of the universe. Oh, this is a good one. Sniper Island. Where is Sniper Island? If Soge King is to be believed, well, it's in your heart. However, we all do know that Usopp's lies have a tendency to come true, as explored on a previous tier of the iceberg. So what if Sniper Island really is an actual place on the Grand Line? What if there's an actual Sniper King who Usa will either learn from or will have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with? Now listen, I know we're expecting a giant-sized arc one day in Elbaf. After all, we'd love to get more closure on Big Mom's story arc, as well as see what our favorite giants like Dory, Broggy, and Hyrogen are up to. But perhaps it's not Elbaf where Usa will become a brave warrior of the sea, but Sniper Island itself. Carrot is the traitor. Now, in retrospect, it seemed obvious that Kanjuro was the traitor. In Kabuki plays, after all, the artist archetype is often cast as a villain or betrayer. His design itself was the biggest clue as to his true allegiances. However, while we did know that there was a traitor, someone who was feeding information, such as the whereabouts of Zo to the Beast Pirates, that didn't stop the fan community from making all kinds of guesses. One of the wildest, that Carrot, new leader of Zo and Straw Hat in our hearts, was the actual traitor all along. She was sneaky enough to infiltrate the Thousand Sunny after all, and she was mysteriously absent from a lot of the proceedings on Wano. Suspicious much? Well, turns out though, she wasn't a spy, she was just sort of done being plot relevant, I guess. Whoops. Oh, okay. I can't remember what light looks like. I can't remember my own name or the faces of my family. At this depth, all there is is one piece. With incredible enthusiasm, onwards to tier number six. Pell 911. Pell did 911. Oh wait, that's the wrong notes. Pell is alive because of 911. At the end of Alabasta, Pell made the ultimate sacrifice in saving everyone from Crocodile's bomb. However, it just so happened that this chapter came out right around the same time as September 11, 2001, the terrorist attack on the Twin Towers in the United States. Now, rumor has it that Joan and Jump editors thought that it would be bad taste to have a character killed in a terrorist attack so close to this event and thus the will of P was born. Kaido in the Colosseum. 
In the D block of the Colosseum in Dressrosa, there was a participant named Meadows. He wore a large leopard skin and a hood and a cape. He had a rather beastly appearance, in fact, and since we all knew of Kaido that he was the king of the beasts, one short-lived theory was actually that this participant was in fact Kaido in disguise. After all, at that point, all we'd seen of the Yonko was a retcon silhouette that ended up looking nothing like Kaido's actual appearance, but did share some similarities with Meadows. However, once Meadows and the rest of Block D were taken out by Hakuba, well, this theory didn't have a leg to really stand on. Unless there were a few big Meadow stands arguing that Cavendish was Yonko level, of course. Next Straw Hat Smoker. Who will be the next Straw Hat? It was a huge debate all throughout Wano. Would Kara join the crew? Would Momo or Tama come along as a cabin boy or girl? Would Yamato join? Well, Oda played us all. It was no one. I mean, we technically got Jimbei properly joining the crew during Wano, but that was a foregone conclusion since way back in Fishman Islands. Though we're still wondering, how did he get away from Whole Cake Island in one piece? Anyways, now some theorists are really looking forward to trying and predict who will join up next, including me. And one guy that we've already talked about thinks that Smoker will become a Straw Hat by the end of the series. The idea goes that Smoker joining the Straw Hats would represent the ultimate merging between the Marines and the Straw Hats. Smoker's personal journey is after all about finding justice and this would mean that he'd finally realize that it's not the world government, but the Straw Hats that are truly on the side of justice. Though I do have to ask, will this man's pride ever allow him to actually call himself a pirate? Charlotte Nami. Fun fact, we still don't know who Nami's parents are. I mean, her real mom will always be Belmere, but her birth mother is still unknown. And back in the first half of the series, I would have said it doesn't even matter who Nami's mom is, but let's look at the facts. Luffy is the son of the world's most wanted man and the grandson of the hero of the marines. Zoro is definitely somehow related to the former daimyo of Ringo, Shimotsuki Ushimaru. Sanji is a literal prince of the Germa kingdom. Usopp's father is a member of a Yonko crew. Are you starting to see a pattern here? So it's really not that unlikely that Nami will follow in the footsteps of the other East Blue crew members and have some sort of really important lineage. But who is she related to? Now, I'm pretty sure it's not Big Mom, but this was a really big theory back before and in the early days of the Whole Cake Island arc. But if not Big Mom, then who? Well, maybe we'll find out in a later iceberg entry, so stay tuned for that. The blonde Gorosei is Sanji's dad. In my heart of hearts, part of me still wishes that this theory had turned out to be true. As soon as Sanji's wanted post at the end of Dressrosa was revealed to have an only alive status, the gears were turning in the community to figure out what was so special about Sanji. I mean, people had long thought that he was important due to little hints like his Mr. Prince identity, but now it was looking like all of our suspicions were truly confirmed. And so the primary suspect? One of the Gorosei, the tall blonde one with the goatee, looks a hell lot like he could be related to Sanji. And as one of the highest powers in the world, he definitely would have had the power to influence the wanted posters. After all, we didn't know about the Vinsmokes yet. And as much as we love our evil Power Rangers that are the Germa Kingdom, Judge doesn't really look like he's related to Sanji other than the blonde hair, really. But hey, if the Gorosei are actually as old as we think they are, maybe there's still hope that the blonde Gorosei is Sanji's great 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 grand grandfather or something. Oh, these theories are getting to me. Shaki was on Roxas' crew. Oh yeah, our favorite Saba Odi bartender and Rayleigh's life partner Shaki retired from piracy decades ago. We do know that. However, we know that she was a major player in the world of piracy at some point as well. In the story's detour to Amazon Lily after Wano, we learned that she was actually the former leader of the Kuja pirates before Boa Hancock. Now, in retrospect, it makes perfect sense and it also explains why Rayleigh has such a close-knit relationship with the residents of Amazon Lily. However, before this reveal, the prevailing theory was that Shaki was actually a member of the Rocks Pirates. After all, every other significant pirate like Whitebeard, Big Mom, Kaido and Shiki were all part of his crew, so why not add some more members? Also, it would give Rayleigh and Shaki's romance a little bit more of a 
forbidden fruit kind of twist. A real Romeo and Juliet flair, but yeah, no, Amazon Lily it was, and we're more than satisfied with that reveal, right? Right? The Celestial Dragons are aliens. Let's just look at the facts. Number one, Celestial has two definitions. It could mean heavenly or mythical, or more literally, it could just mean space stuff. The sun, the moon, the stars, and all of these are celestial bodies. And number two, these clowns wear spacesuits. And I mean, sure, they do justify the giant fishbowls on their heads by saying that they don't want to breathe the same air as commoners. However, that doesn't change the fact that the rest of their fashion looks very outer space-ish. And also kind of weird. Number three, and we've discussed on previous iceberg entries already, we already have confirmed aliens in One Piece, so what's really a few more here or there? The more, the merrier, I say, space pirates, Skypeans, Lunarians, and the space dragons. Ors was Joy Boy. Now, possibly we may have already met the original Joy Boy, Albert, in a roundabout way. Luffy seems to be Joy Boy reincarnated. They share a spirit, a dream, a soul, and even a devil fruit. However, they also may have shared a shadow at one point. On Thriller Bark, the Straw Hat crew had a tag team fight against the massive zombie Ors, a member of the ancient Oni race. Now, it would be also fitting if that zombie, that received Luffy's shadow from Moria just so happened to be the previous incarnation of Joy Boy. We do know, after all, that the previous Joy Boy was likely a giant of some kind. The frozen straw hat beneath Marie Jaw is the biggest clue for just that. Now, the biggest issue with this idea is the timeline. The Void Century, when Joy Boy was supposed to live, was 800 years before the current story, but Ors lived about 500 years ago. However, who knows how effective Moria's carbon dating is? With as much historical manipulation as the world government gets up to, the discrepancy could probably be brushed off by Oda. Akainu is the leader of swords. Akainu is a despicable marine who has killed innocent people and his fair share of aces. Okay, well, one ace, but that's still enough for my count. He's ruthless and will seek out any means necessary to fulfill his idea of justice. SWORD is a secret organization within the Marines that runs counter to the wishes of the world government. Notable members include Kobe, who actively defied Akainu during the Paramount War and would have ended up thoroughly melted if it weren't for Shanks stepping in at the last second. So in more than just one way, Akainu and Sword do seem diametrically opposed to each other. But have you considered this cover page that shows Akainu shirtless? What is that tattoo on his shoulder? No, not the tribal one, his other shoulder. That's right, a sword. Therefore, he must be the leader of S.W.O.R.D. Hey, I mean, a guy who takes care of bonsai trees must have a secret soft side as well, am I right? Shanks' hockey fruits. Oh yeah, Shanks has never been seen to use a devil fruit. In fact, there's a very prominent scene in chapter one of Shanks swimming. Now, could he have theoretically eaten a devil fruit in the meantime between Luffy's backstory and the current storyline? Uh, sure, but then Shanks' whole crew seems to be purposefully made of non-devil fruit users. Also, otherwise, it feels like we should probably have seen at least one power so far. What we have seen Shanks do, however, are some crazy displays of hockey. Arguably, he showed us Conqueror's hockey in the very first chapter when he scared of the Lord of the Coast. He also easily split the sky in his confrontation with Whitebeard, but most recently, he forced Aramaki out of his Logia transformation and got him to back off the scabbards from miles away at sea off the coast of Wano, and he did so with nothing but a long distance bolt of Conqueror's hockey. In other words, this is easily the wildest and greatest feat of hockey we've seen in the entire series. Now for a long time, even before this awesome recent feat, this crazy theory has speculated that Shanks' use of hockey is a devil fruit, that Shanks is a hockey man who ate the hockey hockey no me. Now granted this theory was first conceived before we had any real understanding of what hockey is, and it is still extremely unlikely. But then again, did you click on an iceberg video to get sane, rational theories? No, you're here for the wildest stuff possible. Good job, and also, Cool that you're still here, thanks. CP0 are Big Mom's childhood friends. Big Mom's backstory was one of the most shocking and gruesome moments in the entire story. Sure, we've dealt with slavery, prejudice, corrupt governments, and much, much more, but one thing we never thought we'd see in One Piece, cannibalism. So 
Imagine our surprise when we were treated to Big Mom eating the worst birthday feast of all time in the form of all of her friends. But hear me out, what if she didn't eat all of them. Eagle Eye viewers noticed that a couple of CP0 members who were present at the raid in Onigashima somewhat resembled two of the orphans from Mother Caramel's orphanage who grew up alongside Charlotte Linlin. And really, this theory seems to make a lot of sense. Firstly, the CP0 members all are wearing masks. When a character is masked, it seems logical that they're hiding their identity for some sort of reason as it would be a big reveal when they are all unmasked. So some of us expected to know some of the CP0 characters. After all, some other CP0 members turned out to be familiar faces like Luchi and Kaku. It also makes sense because Mother Caramel was known to sell orphans to the Marines. So if these two survived Big Mom's birthday party, it would make sense for them to end up as operatives for the world government. And on top of it all, since Big Mom was present at the rate, they could play perfectly into developing her story further. After all, we still haven't had the chance to see her reckon with the truth of her past, but we have seen flags for telling it will happen, such as her daughter Pudding having a memory fruit. Now, having left Wano, it does seem like this theory is kind of dead in the water, but it will still live on somehow in our headcanon for now at least. Dumpies. Wait, Dumpies? Why does that sound familiar? Oh, wait a minute. That's a theory that I'm known for. If you know my channel, you might have seen the best One Piece theory ever, I guess, where I dab this theory from Japanese YouTuber Yudeon. Now, it takes a solid half hour to explain fully, but here's the gist. The original map of Jaya looks like a giant skull. The city of gold in Skypiea was located in the skull's right eye, but its left eye is empty. The theory? The One Piece was dismissing left eye and currently resides at the bottom of the strange hole beneath Anna's lobby. You should really go watch that one in full. Ancient Weapon Vivi. Crocodile's master plan in Alabasta wasn't simply to take over the desert country. His actual ambition was to obtain one of the ancient weapons, particularly the battleship, Pluton, which was rumored to lay beneath the country. Now, by now, we do know that Pluton is actually beneath Wano, but what if Alabasta was part of the puzzle of the ancient weapons? In fact, what if Crocodile had one of the ancient weapons within his arm's reach all along? Now, this theory states that Vivi herself is an ancient weapon picked up steam after the Fishman Island arc when all of our previous notions of what an ancient weapon could be were shattered completely when we found out that the mermaid princess Shirahoshi was Poseidon. So just as Shirahoshi can command the Sea Kings, perhaps Vivi is also the conduit by which some force of nature, either Pluton or Uranus, is operated as well. In a dark twist, with Vivi now missing, could Emu be using her as a key to utilize the destructive power of Uranus? All right. We've nearly reached the bottom. Down here, there's just total darkness. Darkness and One Piece theories. Oh, and uh, these weird, messed up looking kind of food. But mostly just darkness and One Piece theories. Theories like the One Piece is on the moon. Now, a large portion of the fanbase hopes that the Straw Hats are going to the moon. I mean, sure, Enel could come back to wreak havoc on the East Blue, but surely Dr. Vegapunk has a spare spacecraft lying around somewhere on Egghead Islands. And really, there are plenty of mysteries still revolving around the moon, some of which we already alluded to on a previous tier of this iceberg, which feels like five years ago. What better way to explore the origins of the Lunarians and the other winged races than to go straight to their source? After all, Laugh Tale is ludicrously hard to reach. Something has to be preventing sailors from just happening on it by chance, right? I mean, sure, it could be terrible storms or something, or being located on the bottom of the ocean, but how cool would it be if it were actually in outer space itself, preventing the average Joe from just reaching the One Piece? The Shichibukai are the seven deadly sins. There are seven warlords, and ever since Full Metal Alchemist named their homunculi after the seven deadly sins, every group of characters featuring seven members has been theorized as being a representative of those sins. Unfortunately, while there are some good comparisons within the group, the analogy kind of falls apart if you think about it for a little bit longer. The clearest ones are probably Boa Hancock as Lust and Gecko Moria as Sloth. 
Hancock because her powers rely on people being infatuated with her, and Moria because he gave up ambitions of traveling the new world and traded them for building a zombie army to do the dirty work for him. Del Flamingo and Crocodile could probably be pride and or greed, but what members of the Shichibukai aren't prideful and greedy really? I mean, they're pirates. It does kind of come with the territory. Wrath and Envy are where things really fall apart for me. I mean, Jinbei could maybe be wrathful because he's angry sometimes, but really, he's usually a pretty chill dude. When what is Kuma envious of? Having free will? Like, who knows? Well, it's fun to speculate about the seven deadly warlords, just, they just, yeah, don't hold up to scrutiny, I think. Nami will control Uranus. Nami is One Piece's number one meteorologist, thanks to tools like the climate tag, technology of Wetheria, and now Big Mom's homie Zeus, Nami has formidable weather-based powers. But how could they become even more powerful? What will Nami's final upgrade be? Well, according to this theory, it'll be the ancient weapon Uranus itself. Now, the real only evidence, if you can call it that, is that Uranus is a god of the sky and weather, and I mean, weather also comes from the sky. Unfortunately for Nami, recent events would suggest that it's actually Imu and the government who do control this powerful weapon. At least if that is what that giant sky laser beam is actually in the end. Christianity exists in One Piece. Ooh, getting religious. Sorry, Anno, but in One Piece there are plenty of gods ready to dethrone you. Obviously, we have things like Sengoku's golden Buddha fruit and Luffy being compared to the Wisdom King or the Sun God Nika, but apparently there are plenty of One Piece characters who do believe and worship the Christian gods, huh? Now, the implications of this have not been explored in the story, but Kuma is clearly carrying around a Bible, the Christian holy book. We've also got the cultists who are trying to worship Satan, but ended up with Brook instead. We have references like the Adam and Eve tree, and all of this begs the question, is there a One Piece Jesus? Rox is Emu. What if Rox actually wasn't defeated on God Valley? What if he actually did fulfill his goal and conquered the world by reaching the empty throne and claimed it for himself. Now this theory was especially popularized by Archer, the Library of Ahara's fan comic, The Return to the Reverie, which explored an alternate idea of what could have occurred after the Reverie arc. In it, we see Emu uncovering himself as rocks and doing battle against the Revolutionary Army. If you haven't read it, it's really, really well made. Like, the production quality is insane. It's so professionally done. It does look like a real chapter, I'd say. Fire Festival Ghosts. This one was a huge part of Joy Boy Theory's Wano Arc Agenda, another YouTuber. In Japan, the tradition of holding a fire festival often connects to the idea of sending of spirits or reconnecting with ancestors. The thought was that the fire festival could literally see ghosts of past characters manifest during the raid. At various points in the arc, characters impersonated characters long thought dead. Kanjiro created a fake Odin, Black Maria created the illusion of Robin's mother and Professor Clover, and so this theory said that these characters and more would come back to create some very emotional moments in which flashback characters could see how much the Straw Hats have grown. And Odin reappearing would of course have truly struck fear into Kaido's heart. Add this to the list of theories that were a little bit sad that they didn't come true. Snow Bunny Carrots in Punk Hazard, we learned that when a devil fruit user dies, the fruit reincarnates into a nearby piece of normal fruit. After Caesar's pet Smiley, the doomsday axolotl died, a random nearby fruit turned into the axolotl zone. However, Smiley wasn't the only fruit user that died in Punk Hazard. Monet, the snow fruit user, also died. Now, we're not sure about Punk Hazard's fruit reserves, but we do know that the Thousand Sunny happens to have a few of Nami's treasured orange trees growing on it. And so the thought behind this theory was that Monet's snow fruit would have jumped onto one of these oranges to then be unwittingly eaten by someone on the Straw Hat ship. A prime suspect for this after though was none other than Carrot. After the sunny sailed away from Punk Hazard, a strange panel featured a bunch of bunnies depicted in waves beneath the ship, which was thought to be foreshadowing to the snow bunny Carrots. Evil Shanks. What if Shanks but... Evil. Now, even though Shanks' presence has loomed over the series since the very first chapter, we know shockingly little about his actual motivations. We do know he's wildly powerful, 
able to stop the Paramount War with a single sentence, and now we know that he's making his move to claim the One Piece. We also do know that he stole the Gomu Gomu no Mi from the world government and might have known that it was much much more than meets the eye. And we know that he can seek an audience with the Gorosei at his own whim. Now all of these details add up to make a super mysterious character. And as Luffy's hero, we've always thought of him as a great man. But could there be a darker and more evil side to this Emperor of the Sea? Could he be orchestrating events in the series for his own dark purposes? Sea Stone Sandals. Oh yeah, this one. Oh yeah. So the year is 2008. The arc is Saba Odi Archipelago and the One Piece fanbase would not yet know the wonders of hockey. Now at this point in the story, Logias were still pretty much unstoppable because of their intangibility and there were seemingly no ways to overcome them unless you had a natural counter. And so the only way so far we've seen Logia users be defeated by Luffy was when he used water to defeat Crocodile and when he resisted Enel's lightning power with his rubbery body. However, there was one exception to this. Seastone. Smoka Seastone had been seen to incapacitate Devil Fruit users and Seastone handcuffs or jail cells could keep them captive. So when we saw Dark King Rayleigh stop Kizaru and Sabaody, a man made of light with just a kick, the fanbase jumped to some conclusions. Obviously, the key to his stopping the Admiral was in his footwear his uh, sea stone sandals. Pangea Kingdom. The base of operations for the world government is Pangea Castle. Now this idea states that Pangea Castle is actually named for the ancient kingdom itself. After the kingdom fell, the world government took its place and took up residence in Pangea Castle. Moreover, Pangea Castle, which sits on top of the red line, is named for its supercontinent, which once existed on our real earth. That was before the tectonic movements separated the world into the seven continents, we now know today. Now the theory goes that such a continent may have existed in the One Piece world as well before the world was separated into many islands and scattered across the sea with the only continent remaining being the Red Line. The Mihawk Homey. In the beginning of the Whole Cake Island arc, we received the revelation that Big Mom wielded the Soul Soul Fruit. Now this fruit filled her island to the brim with all sorts of whimsical creatures who were imbued with parts of her soul. The trees, the food, and anything really was transformed into things called homies. We also learned that as a tax for living in Whole Cake Island, a small portion of each citizen's soul was taken each year to empower the Emperor. Now when we learned about her soul manipulation abilities, the community was abuzz trying to figure out the implications of this ability. And particularly one homie named the Crane Rider Randolph, a gallant rabbit warrior, made some viewers very curious. They noticed some surface level similarities between Randolph and the warlord Dracul Mihawk and thus speculated that Randolph may have just held a portion of the Shichibukai soul. Panda Man, the Guardian Angel. Now, there is a special force watching over the world of One Piece, the Panda Man. Now, this Easter egg character has been hidden in tons of chapters all throughout the series. He's practically omnipresent throughout the story. So is it really a mere coincidence that he's hiding in the panels of so many chapters, seemingly following the Straw Hats around on their adventures? Perhaps he is more than just an easter egg, and this panda-headed hero is actually the Straw Hats' guardian angel. Django's power-up Back in Syrup Village, one member of the Kudo Pirates was none other than Django the Hypnotist. At one point, he even hypnotized members of his own crew to increase their strength when they were fighting against the Straw Hats. However, as a gag, Luffy was also hypnotized and started rampaging as well. Now, this theory suggests that Luffy's insane strength throughout the entire series is all thanks to this hypnotism received by Django. In fact, Luffy is still hypnotized even now. It's not just his will or devil fruit, he refuses to to ever give up no matter how many times he's been defeated because he's literally compelled to do so. Alright, Avast mateys, 20,000 leaks under the One PC. I never thought we'd make it this deep. I've just been told that the submarine here is out of rations and I'm afraid we're not long for this world. But at least before I go, we get to explore the most absurd One Piece theories of all time here down at tier level 8. Kaido is a poneglyph. You heard me right. Kaido is a poneglyph. At least, that's what some people used to think. Now, all that we really knew about the fearsome Kaido, the world's strongest creature, is that he was said to be indestructible. Nothing could harm this beast. And you know what else is said to be indestructible? Poneglyphs. 
Therefore, the only logical conclusion is that Kaido was a poneglyph that ate an ancient Oni devil fruit. The devil fruits are people. Now, we've already had more cannibalism in One Piece than in any other average story, which, you know, not a high bar to cross, but still. However, as we learn the secrets of the Ancient Kingdom, it might be that One Piece gets another one of these super crazy twists. That's right, devil fruits are made of people. Now, we have actually seen some possible evidence of past users' wills or memories or personalities even being embedded into fruits, and it's unclear whether fruits might impact the user's personality. Is Luffy emblematic of freedom because he ate the fruit, or did he eat the fruit because he's emblematic of freedom? Same with Doflamingo being manipulated and controlling, and so on and so forth. So, were devil fruits possibly created from people who happened to have these abilities? And were their personalities or souls passed alongside with those abilities? Emu Dinami. Now, just as we discussed earlier that Nami could possibly be Big Mom's child, this theory is also predicated on the idea that we don't quite know yet who Nami's birth parents are. So let's go crazy with it. Nami is the daughter of Imu. And let's throw in the D initial as well for good measure. This would really make for a Darth Vader level twist. And hey, if she joins up with her pops, maybe he'll let her control the ancient weapon Uranus after all. It's a win-win, other than the islands that get obliterated on the map, but eh, win-win. Sanji is Uranus. <laughs> okay, hear me out. Back in the day, minds were blown when we found out that Shirahoshi was Poseidon. We had absolutely no idea that an ancient weapon being a person was even a possibility. The mermaid princess is big, but she's no warship. So suddenly everything was on the table and the fanbase was wrecking our collective brains to figure out which characters could be other ancient weapons. Now conveniently, around this same time on Fishman Island, Sanji had just revealed his Skywalk ability and Uranus is a god of the sky. Ergo, Sanji is Uranus? Simply as that, really. Kuina is Mihawk. Kuina is Toshigi? Broke. Kuina is Mihawk? Very woke. Now, obviously, Kuina didn't fall down the stairs. That would be such an unceremonious death. Clearly, what actually happened is that Kuina left with the revolutionaries when Dragon docked at Shimotsuke when Zoro was still a child. She was always told growing up that as a girl, she could never become the world's greatest swordsman. Therefore, she asked Ivankov to perform a sex change on her. Afterwards, taking on the new name Dracul Mihawk, he became the world's strongest swordsman. The One Piece is in Bartos' briefcase. In the Colosseum on Dressrosa, when we first met Bartolomeo, he was carrying a mysterious briefcase chained to his wrist. And there was a panel that focused heavily on this briefcase, suggesting that it was very important. The briefcase was never mentioned or seen ever again. And so obviously, we can logically conclude that its contents were none other than the One Piece. Barto had found it in order to make an offering to Luffy so that he could make his hero the King of Pirates. However, he was so starstruck when he met the Straw Hat the first time that he promptly forgot all about it and left the briefcase in Dressrosa. Kobe is the final boss. The first marine that Luffy ever met on his journey, not counting his childhood guardian garb, was Kobe, the pink-haired cabin boy of the Elvita pirates. Now, Luffy had had a dream to become the Pirate King, and Kobe had the dream to become a Marine Admiral. And while these two have been allies and friends throughout the series, their two goals are kind of diametrically opposed to each other. And so a truly wild twist to the series would be, instead of Luffy going up against someone like a Kainu, would be to go up against one of his oldest friends in a clash of ideals. Kobe would need one hell of a power-up to contend with with the future Pirate King, but if it would make for a memorable ending, I mean, I think it would. Who knows? Big Mom, the NHC 10 addict. We all know that Big Mom has had some really serious hunger pains, but so do all of the no-so-little kids that the crew rescued from Punk Hazard. Now, that's a pretty strange coincidence that these seemingly unrelated characters both suffer from the same condition. However, there are a few connections between the two groups. Big Mom had contracted Caesar Clown to do work for her, and he was also the one who was performing gigantification experiments on the children. The children's hunger pains and subsequent terrible rampages were due to withdrawal from an addictive drug called NHC-10. He fed this drug to the children by hiding it inside candy, much like all the sweet treats that Big Mom loves so, so much. 
Big Mom is also notably giant compared to normal humans. So was she a failed experiment before being dropped off an Elbaf? Is she too an NHC 10 addict who is constantly feeling some major withdrawal symptoms from the drug? Oda is pro-monarchy. Now one would think that with story features like the Revolutionary Army and Luffy's general opposition to authority and declaring war on a literal world government, that Oda is very against authoritarian regimes. However, that might might not be true at all. Oda seemingly loves kingdoms with one central authority, a monarch, so long as they have a very nice king or queen instead of an evil ruler. From Vivi to Shirahoshi to Rebecca, the Straw Hats love their monarchs and it's just when it's a pirate or Wapol in charge that the system of government really falls apart in the story. Rockstar is rocks. <laughs> oh boy. Rox de Zebek was a scourge upon the One Piece world, striking fear into the hearts of the world government and other pirates alike. Rockstar is a rookie who somehow landed a spot on Shanks' crew. Now, observant viewers will realize that the name Rockstar has Rox right in it. Coincidence? I think not. It's not impossible that Rox did not die, but simply waited and bided his time until his old rival Roger passed away. And since Shanks is very likely a celestial dragon who was found on God Valley, he's likely just waiting for his chance to take out God Valley's last survivor. Zoro's bouncy hunter Long Con. This is, might actually be my favorite. So when Luffy recruits Roronoa Zoro, the swordsman laughs him off. After all, he was literally known as the pirate hunter Zoro. He was one of the most infamous bounty hunters in the East Blue. So this theory says that Zoro's membership in the crew is actually a really long game. He may seem like the most unwaveringly loyal crewmate and vice captain of all time. However, in actuality, he protects Luffy at all costs because Luffy is his prey. After all, at the beginning of the story, Luffy's bounty is nothing. However, if Luffy can achieve his dream of becoming the Pirate King, well, he'll have the highest bounty ever known. And once Zoro brings him into the Marines, well, he'll be set for life. Void Century Bonnie. Uh-oh, uh, this theory is not looking too great lately now that we're in the Egghead Island arc. We've learned that in actuality, Bonnie is Kuma's daughter and is learning about the Void Century along with the rest of the Straw Hats from Vegapunk. However, just as it was once speculated that she might be related to Big Mom, her true age has always been a pressing question. If she can manipulate her age at will, it seems possible that she could be much, much, much older than she let on. Like Void Century old, which could have explained what Blackbeard wanted with her. However, now it seems that her preferred age is simply her actual age, which is kind of sad. Gaimon is the One Piece. I actually lied earlier when I said that the One Piece was the friends we made along the way, or that it was the Straw Hat, or it was the Moon, or in Bartolomeo's briefcase. Because obviously, the real One Piece is not the friends we made along the way, it was one specific friend that we made along the way, Gaimon. I mean, if you really think about it for more than three seconds, it kind of becomes obvious. First off, he's on an island of rare animals. What else is rare? The One Piece. Secondly, Gaimon is what? A treasure chest and what is the One Piece? Huh? A treasure. I really, Oda couldn't have foreshadowed this revelation any harder, so checkmate theorists, I'd say. Whew, okay, so this was enough iceberg to sink the 10 Titanic captains, but Against all odds, we actually made it through together all the way. Like, you're still here, which is crazy. <laughs> Whether our sanity is still intact, that is up for debate. But that iceberg couldn't stop us because dreams never die. <laughs> if you need another one hour video after this one because you're that type of crazy, well, you can watch my mega one analysis right here.